One of the striking features of the Buddha's awakening was that when he gained knowledge, he didn't rest content with the knowledge. He had said that all along throughout the practice, that the secret to gaining awakening was just that, not resting content with skillful qualities. When he gained knowledge, the question was what to do with it, how to use it, how best to use it, particularly for the sake of putting an end to suffering. That's a sign of his heedfulness, realizing that we live in a world where our actions do make a difference between whether we're going to suffer or not. It was conviction in that principle that led him to practice. He tested many different attitudes, many different theories. The ones he didn't test were the ones you can't test, the ones that said, well, you have no power, you have no choice, you have no free will. He had realized early on that those thoughts, those ideas, were a dead end. So his conviction was there must be a way to act that could lead to an end of suffering. And so when you think about his awakening and develop conviction in it, part of that conviction has to be that we have to be heedful too. So what does it mean to have conviction in the Buddha's awakening, and how do you use it? You can ask yourself, given that we're sometimes told that the awakening means things depend on causes and conditions, how do you use that knowledge? Some people treat that as an end. In other words, you arrive at that knowledge and you just content yourself with it, or make yourself be content with it. But the Buddha's question would be, how do you manipulate causes and conditions so that you don't have to suffer? Because after all, the principle of causality that he discovered was not simply that things are the result of past actions. He denounced that as a particularly evil form of wrong view. Things are also shaped by your present actions. So if you really have conviction in the Buddha's awakening, you should look at your actions and try to do what's skillful and abandon what's unskillful. This is how the strength of conviction leads to strength of persistence. You willingly take on the role of agency. You are responsible for your actions. You're the one making the choices. And that you're going to benefit from those choices if you make them well. There's a joy in taking on that role. I've mentioned before the studies they've done of children who find that they can make a noise or do something and get the same result again and again and again, and it gives them happiness. The sense that they can figure out their environment and manipulate it to do something they want to do. And of course, in the beginning, just making noises drives everybody else crazy, but for the child it's the beginning of a sense of control, a sense of power. And then from that you develop your sense of agency, if you're wise. So not just making noises. You're actually looking at your actions and seeing what does lead to happiness, what doesn't lead to happiness, and what leads to long-term happiness as opposed to short-term. Then as you learn these lessons, you've got to learn how to keep them in mind. This is how the strength of persistence, when you're heedful, develops the strength of mindfulness. You have to be alert to what you're doing. You have to try to do it well. That's what the persistence is. But it's also the ardency in right mindfulness. You see what you're doing. You see the results. And you try to keep that knowledge in mind. This is why mindfulness is said to be a refuge. Because you gain knowledge, but then you forget it. It's useless. You have to store up your knowledge. Part of storing it up is learning that, yes, you can develop skillful qualities in the mind, and you can abandon unskillful ones, to the point where you're <coughs> thinking nothing but skillful things. But that can be tiring. So the mind needs to rest from time to time. And so the strength of mindfulness leads to the strength of concentration when you're heedful.
because you know if the mind gets tired, it's very easy to slip back to your old and skillful ways. So the mind does need to rest. And it requires some thinking to get it to settle down. As you learn how to play with the breath, play with your meditation object. See what works, see what doesn't work. Use your imagination. I read a passage one time where I was accused of having an imaginative way of teaching concentration, presented as an accusation. Somebody picking up on a John Lee's theme was that when you're developing a skill, you have to think in ways that you haven't thought before, ask questions you haven't thought before. You're going to learn new things that way, so that you can get the mind to settle down. Sometimes we're warned that concentration is bad for you, that it'll get you stuck on pleasure. But from the Buddhist perspective, that's not the case. And it is possible to get stuck, but it also teaches you how not to get stuck. One, it gives you an alternative to sensual pleasure, the pleasure of sensuality, thinking about sensual fantasies, lust. Desire, greed, which for most of us is our only escape from suffering, our only escape from pain. But the Buddha gives you an alternative. You can have a sense of well-being, a sense of intense well-being throughout the body, simply by the way you breathe, by the way you re relate to the breath. That's one way. Another way is that it requires that if you're going to get the mind to stay with its object, you can't let yourself simply wallow in the pleasure that comes when the breath is good. You do indulge in the pleasure for a while. The Buddha says that again and again. But at the same time, you can't just wallow, because everything will blur out. So you have to learn how to stay with the breath, even though the pleasure can get intense. And then you begin to see that Intense pleasure or intense rapture can become tiresome. So you let that go. You tune the mind into a more subtle level of energy. And you realize that equanimity can really be pleasurable. It's a higher form of pleasure, a more subtle form of pleasure. And then finally, the fact that you've been learning how to put this mental state together makes you more aware of the process of fabrication of the mind. And you begin to see that this is a greater pleasure than you've had before. But it still has its drawbacks, the fact that you have to keep it going. And this is why the mind inclines more and more to wanting to find something that doesn't require fabrication. This is how concentration leads to discernment, if you do it heedfully. You learn how to see individual events in the mind just as that, events that influence one another as causes and conditions. And the question is not so much to see the oneness of all things or to rejoice in our interconnectedness, but to see where you can ferret out exactly where does the mind lead with its intentions. Is it possible to let go of those intentions? Because that's what the fabrication is. And it's not straightforward. It requires some subtlety and it requires your powers of observation and your powers of reflection. This is why the Buddha used a mirror as an image for the practice. You look in the mirror and you observe your mind. So that even the strength of discernment has to be let go. You know those five steps that the Buddha gives for overcoming unskillful thoughts? You see them as they arise to see how they're originated. What from within the mind causes them. You see them passing away. And when the mind picks them up again, you ask yourself, why? What's the allure? And this is going to take some digging down, because the mind is often very dishonest with itself about why it goes for a particular thought. And then you compare the allure with the drawbacks. And when you finally get to the point where, in the comparison, you see that the drawbacks way outweigh the allure. 
and you get to the point where you wouldn't want to hold on to that allure anymore. That's when you have your escape through dispassion. Well, eventually you apply the same principles to the five strengths. You see that they too are conditioned. They've helped you along. As the Buddha said, it's like taking a raft across the river. And you realize, okay, I don't need to carry the raft anymore. You have a sense of appreciation for it. This has been a good raft. It's taking you far. So you're letting it go, not out of disgust, but simply out of a realization that you don't need it. You found something better. And this is where the five strengths take you. When you reflect on them, and when you practice them heedfully, this is why the Buddha said that they depend on heedfulness. You take the lessons from the awakening, and you try to use them as best you can. You don't simply content yourself with an insight or with some knowledge. You keep asking yourself, what's the use of this? What's the best use of this? And as you keep developing this strength of heedfulness, that's how all the other strengths make you strong.